Now grab your Bibles. I said, well, that's we do this little different Tuesday night Bible study. Just kind of break open the Word of God and try to find some nuggets of truth in there to apply for our lives right here, right now, today. And so I want to look at um, Exodus chapter number 14. I want to start reading at verse number one. I'll go, I'll go back to this. I tonight want to do this. Is it okay if we got to look in some area in between sometimes that we don't always look at? So I want to look at where in Egypt the death angel flew over. We know that there's mourning in the land. There's this great loss because of the eldest dying who did not have the blood of the, of the lamb applied to the doorpost. So I want to start following that where, where Pharaoh says, go, go. But I don't even want to go as far as the Red Sea. So I, I'm not, I don't even really necessarily want to look at the Red Sea. I want to look at that little last of time that's right there in between. And I feel like there are some good things for us to learn as we look at that little area. Because it will take tonight to be able to look at that, that little area. And it's amazing how God spoke to, to Moses. Remember Moses goes to his father Jethro. And Jethro releases him. Uh, he goes and, and he becomes the leader that God wants him to be. Prior to that he tried to do things his own way. But now God speaks to him through the burning bush. God gives him the confidence of knowing that it, when you go you have the identity of who I am. That you can identify that this is who you represent and this is who you're a spokesman for. And you want God's people to go. The Bible says that the Lord spoke unto Moses saying, Speak unto the children of, uh, of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pi-Hiroth between Migdol and the sea and against Bilifon. Bil uh, 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 before it, sh before before it shall ye encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them. And I will honor, uh, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. And we'll just kind of stop. Well, let's read verse number 5. And it was told uh, the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people and said, Why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? And he made already his chariot and looked upon uh, and, and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and, and, and his horsemen and his army and overtook them encamping by the sea beside uh, 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 Pi-Hiroth. The Bible says, and before Belisavon. Let's just stop there. How many of you have ever been in a tough place before? There's a story I heard that was of a, a man who worked at a train station and he had a parrot. And his parrot uh, began to learn from his master. All of a sudden, there would be men coming into the train station all at one time. Uh, and they would want to take it to go somewhere, Brother Craig. And he would say, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. And so his parent learned to say that, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. One day, 
the, uh, the ticket master left the cage open to where the parrot was, and the parrot flew away. And so the ticket master, he went everywhere looking for where this parrot was, and he came to where there was a wooden area by the track, and he noticed that there were crows just flying all around this tree, diving in at the tree. And he got closer and, he, and closer, and he realized that his parrot was in the tree, and he noticed that, that, that the crows flying one right after another in him to soar him and get him. And he said, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. How many of you ever feel like in life you wish like life's problems would come one at a time instead of all of them at one time? You ever feel that way? Like they're all coming at all at one time? You may say that you're in a pinch, you're in a jam, your back's against the wall, you're in a pickle, uh, uh, you're, you're, you're behind the eighth ball, and you're, you're, you're up the creek without a paddle. I mean, all of those things, you just feel like you're in a very difficult situation. So how do we handle that when life is coming at us all at one time, when we feel like we're in a pickle, when we feel like our back's against the wall, when we feel like, say, one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time. How do, we, how do we handle that? And I think that really when I look at the Word of God, that that's what I'm seeing right here in this situation with the children of Israel. If I were to read on, all of a sudden they start coming against Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out here? We should have stayed back in Egypt. Sometimes we can feel like we're in a pickle. We can wish like we're in a place where we, we know it's not good, but we don't like the pickle that we're in right now. We don't like being up against the wall. We don't like the trials. I like what Romans 15, 4 says. It says, for, whoso, for, for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of scriptures might have hope. The scriptures were written for us that when we find ourselves in this pickle, we find ourselves up against the wall. The scriptures remind us that we were destined to be here because our lives were in the hand of God. And the scriptures remind us that we have hope. That we have hope. And maybe some of this comes from most recently most recently for me being sick there for, for two weeks, it's a reminder that our hope is in God. When we're sick, we can't make ourselves better. We can't do it. Uh, when, when we feel uh, uh, frustrated, when we feel, but our hope is found in God. He's our only hope. He's the one that we can trust in. And so I want us to look at, I think, some very good things um, the Bible says in verse number one, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they uh, turn and encamp before Pi Hiroth. And so we, we need to know something in our life. Who is giving orders and who is leading? When we as believers are living our life for God, the one who's giving the orders is God Almighty. Amen. The one who is leading is God. Amen. Our lives are not led of our own. They're not just, some people think that, that our life is like smoke coming out of the chimney. And whatever the way the wind blows is whatever way that we're directed to go. But I need to tell you that when we dedicate our lives to God, amen, our lives are being led by God. Amen. Here it was. God knew what was he was doing in the lives of the children of Israel. And he also knew the heart of Pharaoh. And he, he knew all about that. They were still in the middle of God's plan. No matter how frustrated they may have felt. No matter how in a pick or how up against the wall they may have felt. Their life was still in God's hands. And so let me first of all just say, who is leading your life? When you feel like you're in that pickle, when you feel like you're in that jam, amen, understand that your life is being led by God. And God was bringing them to this place because He was going to teach them a very valuable lesson. So when our schedules are hectic, when everything seems to be coming against us, and we want to say one at a time, gentlemen, one at a time, but it doesn't work that way, remember this, 
that God was teaching the children of Israel a very valuable lesson. So in our lives, when we're in similar circumstances, God is teaching us a lesson. What's the lesson, God? Teach me. And so he was going to protect them. And we find that, 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 that this isn't going to be their last trial. Pharaoh's not going to be their last trial. Amen. And, and so here it is. They thought that they were departing from, from Israel and that it was all going to be fine. But let me tell you something. Our walk with God will be full of trials. It's going to be. But God is going to teach us some valuable lessons. And he's going to remind us through Scripture that we have hope. Hey. Amen. Thank God for the hope that we have in us. And, and so know that the, our trials are for growth and for benefits. James says, knowing this, that the trying of our faith worketh patience, but let patience have our perfect work, uh, uh, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So when we're in this pickle, when we're in this jam, when everything's coming against us, let patience have a work. Because the Bible says patience is working, that we may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That's what the Word of God says. Romans says, and not only so, Romans 5, 3, but we glory in our tribulations, knowing that tribulations worketh patience. Job said it, we say it often. Job said, you know it, the way that I take them when it has tried me, I shall come forth as pure gold. And so this is the thing that we have to remember. From God's point of view, he saw that there was a wilderness. He saw the mountains on both sides. He saw the Red Sea in front of them. He saw Pharaoh's army with magnificent chariots and a great big army behind them. But God, from his point of view, also saw the opportunity to open up the Red Sea and that God was going to provide for them. Now, I know that on our, our worry barometer, things are escalating high, and it's reading high. Do you know why? Because we don't see it from God's point of view. We don't see life from God's point of view most often times. We don't get the privilege. God doesn't show us uh, the aerial view of everything. God doesn't show us the beginning and the end. We don't get that. But one thing that we do get is that God who sees the view is the God who's with us. We may not have His view, but we have Him. Thank you. Amen. So tonight, know that when trials are coming against us, when life is stacked up, when it's difficult, when it's one thing after another, amen, we don't get the big picture, but we can always hold and trust the Him who has the view. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We don't have God's point of view, but we have Him and we can trust Him. Now, when we go through this, and it's easy to read through this, and, and we probably all have done this. We've read through this, and we get to the place where they're being released from Egypt. We love that. I mean, it's a highlight. It's an escalation of seeing God just pouring out His wrath upon, uh, upon, uh, upon uh, Egypt as, as, as the oldest dies, but God's protection upon those who love Him. And how exciting. And then we still, uh, uh, the Passover, and Jesus being a fulfillment of Passover, how magnificent is that? And then we get to the Red Sea, but we often forget this little nugget of truth that's somewhere in between. And so I want to look at the names of, of particularly three places that they pass by and what this means. Honey, can you do me a favor? Can you run back to my office and there's a bottle of water that I have from somebody? Can you just grab that for a team? <coughs> so we notice that the Bible says that they turned and encamped before pa 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 Sorry, I get tongue-tied as I say that. But when we look at Paharoth, if you look at this, the label of this really means the place of liberty. So here they are. I want you to imagine the children of Israel, this great being Exodus, as we started reading Exodus. They're being Exodus out of Egypt. They're about to go to the promised land. We know it's a longer journey than what they anticipate and really what God's initial plan is. 
but here in this little place before they find themselves and trapped uh, and trapped by the wilderness, the mountains, the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army, he takes him by Pi-ha-herath. Herath. And so the place of liberty. I need to tell you that we have to remember something. We may have trials in our life. Thank you. But God's reminder is that He has brought salvation and deliverance. And He brings each one of us as believers by pa ha 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 ra. And He brings us to the place of liberty. Jesus Christ, the place where every sin, every shackle, every addiction is broken. And we're given liberty. The yeah. Bible says, He whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Thank you. So remember this, that when we go through the trials of life, when we find ourselves in that pickle, that jam, up against the wall, and, and when we don't like it, and we're waiting with patience for God to deliver us and teach us a lesson, remember that God has already taken us by the place where we have had extreme liberty. We're no longer entangled by the things of this world. We're no longer enslaved by the yoke of bondage and sin. But God has delivered us. Amen. And if He delivered us from this world, He's going to continue to keep us as we make our journey on to our eternal destination. Amen. To ever be with Him. Amen. On this journey, we are going to have trials. If things are going to come against us. We're not going to like it. We're going to feel like our back's up against the wall. It is going to be trials. Amen. One thing after another. But the reminder is God has already liberated us and we don't need to be entangled by the affairs of this life. We don't need to allow the barometer of worry to escalate and fear to overtake us because God has already set us free. Not only did he bring them back by uh, hi, here off. But he brings him by a place called Migdol. And Migdol means this. In its uh, 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 original context, it would mean a tower or a fortress. Now, I know that we've all heard this many times before, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower that, <coughs> that the righteous can run into and be safe. But we need to be reminded when everything seems to be coming against us, amen, and we're in places that we don't particularly care for, that we do have a fortress in God Almighty, amen, that when we find ourselves in that place, that the Lord's our security, the Lord is our protection, and the Lord is our fortress. It's easy to worry. It's natural. Amen. But the reminder is this, that God brought them and they did worry. The children of Israel did worry. They looked to the Lord, but they did worry as well. Read the scripture. But God reminded them in their journey, I brought you by a place of liberty. I brought you by a place of knowing that I am a fortress. We have to remind ourselves of the liberty we have in Christ and we have to remind ourselves of the fortress we have in God Almighty. Hey. Not only does he bring them past Pahirath and by Migdol, but he brings them by Belazephon. What does that mean? Well, this is interesting. It means the Lord of the North. The Lord of the North. What can we spiritually gain or understand from that? Because north, most often in the Bible, is associated with judgment. Here it is, the children of Israel. The army of, of Egypt is coming against them. They're scared. I'll talk more about it in a minute. Can you imagine the dust that they're seeing from chariots? 
I mean, we're talking, this is like the arm, armored tanks that are coming toward them of that day. This is the best of the best. They're coming against them to get them. They're, they're on feet. I mean, they're, they're not going to move that fast. But God said, wait a second. I bring judgment. Sometimes when life, we feel like we're in that pickle. Whatever it is that's coming against us, I want to remind you that we have the Lord in all. Who brings judgment? He's going to judge. He's going to avenge us of our enemies. He's going to be the one who works and moves. So tonight, when you find yourself in that place, know that we have a holy God who's going to judge. And we know that he deals with Pharaoh and his army because we know the rest of the story. Amen. When you read down through the scripture, and the Bible says... Uh, uh, that they were in, 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 entangled. Uh, uh, the word entangled uh, in Hebrew means confused or perplexed or lost. See, Pharaoh presumed that, that the Jews were confused and wandering aimlessly. But I need to tell you something, that when we serve God, <coughs> we don't wander aimlessly. We're not confused. We don't serve a God who's an author of confusion. We serve a God who's an author of clarity. Amen. And so He is leading them and He is guiding them. Amen. He is the one who's going to fight their enemies. And so in verse number 5, the Bible says, And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled. And the heart of Pharaoh and the servants turned against the people. They said, Why have we done this that, that we let Israel go from serving us? Let me just tell you. Pharaoh is like a dog returning to his vomit. He has done what's correct. But now all of a sudden, he's going back to what's incorrect. And so, uh, uh, verse number 6 through 9, the Bible says, He made ready his chariots and, and, and his people. I want you to think about this. Pharaoh recruits his army to attack. 600 chosen charioteers are gone. Now when we think about this, here are the best of the best. And from what I understand, that there were three people that were on these chariots. There was a driver, there was a defender of the chariot, and there was a warrior. I want you to imagine, here coming against them is all of these chariots. And uh, they were powered by two or four horses, and they were usually thoroughbreds that were uh, renowned and known for their strength and for their stamina, for their spirit. And here they are, all the strength and the glory of Egypt coming against the children of, of Israel. Folks, that's a lot to make you a little nervous. Let's talk about the natural. The physical things that are coming against them is a lot to make them nervous. Here they are in the desert. There's not too many clouds. Especially if you see a tan cloud, you're concerned. And all this tan cloud is rising from all the chariots. They look back and they see the dust rising. They know what's coming against them. And so here it is that they look, they know that the king wants revenge. And so here it is, Israel, Egypt, defiant, bold, confident. The Bible says this, that when is Egypt left Israel, they left with a what? High. High hand. They left strong. They left confident. They knew that God was working in their midst. And so here it is, they're leaving with this high hand. And let me tell you something, Satan hates it when the people of God begin to act in a high hand. You hear me tonight? When we're smiling, when we're victorious, when we have the victory, Satan hates it. When the people of God are living in a high hand. And that's exactly what happened in Egypt. Here it is that Pharaoh and all of his army, they were upset because the children of Israel left with a high hand. They're upset. It makes the devil mad. Can I tell you, when you're living victorious in your life, when God is working and moving and your Christian walk is going in 
in such a way that you are happy and proud to know that the hand of God is working and moving. Oh, it stirs hell up. And so here it is. Satan's on the attack. Peter said it this way, be sober, be vigilant. He said, because your adversary, this devil, amen, <coughs> as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Verse number 10. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now I see two things. Here it is. They notice that, that the army of, of Egypt is behind them. The Bible says they're sore afraid. But they call out to God. Let's be transparent. Let's be honest. How many times have we been afraid? And we call out on God in prayer. Is that not the natural thing we do as believers? That's what we do. And so here it is. Here it is that they're in a pickle. They're in a jam. The story is told of two men that were riding bicycles. You know those double bicycles? And they were on the last leg of the, 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 the race that they were riding. But it was all uphill. And so they got to the top of the hill and the guy on the front of the bicycle, he said, man, that was the stiffest, toughest hill that we had to climb. He said, I, the, the second round in the back said, yeah, I know. He said, I was so afraid we were going to go backwards. I kept the brakes on the whole time. <laughs> so the front guy's pedaling, the back guy's on the brake, making it hard. Sometimes that's the way we are in a Christian walk. <clears throat> we want to win. We want to get there. But, but, but we're stifled by fear as well. And this is kind of where the children of Israel are. They're, they're calling up on God, but they're fearful. <laughs> Sometimes, sometimes what we need to do is just remind ourselves. Wasn't it just hours ago that the death angel passed over for God brought safety to our house? But how soon we forget the protection of God. So they're scared and they're praying. But I think a better resource for us would be to reflect what God has done and trust and pray. Because that reflection and knowing the God that we serve begins to dissipate fear. Amen? Amen. That's for all of us. Anxiety and fear can overtake our life. We can feel in that pickle. We can feel up against the wall. That's a natural thing. <coughs> but the godly thing is, is to look in the spirit and say, I might be up against the wall, but I remember what God did, and I'm going to pray and trust Him yes, for this situation. That's a life lesson for us to learn. That's a growth. That's patience. That's things that's valuable. Their cry of faith was made. But it was also made as they were fearful. Why do you think sometimes we respond in fear instead of the Lord's ability to take care of us? Can I share my little story with you? One day, Johnny's mom was making a recipe. And she said, Johnny, I need a can of tomatoes from the pantry so that I can finish this recipe. Charlie said, oh, Mommy, I don't like going to the pantry. It's so dark. It's scary. I don't want to go in there. She said, Johnny, go get the tomatoes so I can finish the recipe. Mommy, I'm scared. She said, Johnny, remember that Jesus is there. It may be dark. You may not see well. But Jesus is there. So Johnny goes to the pantry and he starts to open up the door and he notices it's dark. And he says, Oh, Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me that 
can of tomatoes. <laughs> you know, sometimes, my apologies, sometimes that's us. We know he's there, but we still allow fear to overtake us. And so, though afraid, I have to say Israel still did the right thing. They prayed. When our circumstances go south, when things are difficult, pray. 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 And you may say, but this is not what we as believers should do, Pastor. It's what we should do. But sometimes it's a thing that we don't do. We look for all the other resources. We look for all the other wisdom and people. And we forget to pray. And then as we read, you know what? They get upset with Moses. Moses, why did you do this? You have us on the wrong side of the Red Sea. We don't need to go to Cape. What? So they're upset. Can I just say something? Sometimes in our circumstances, it's easy to blame others. But can we just trust God? That God is working in these circumstances to build faith, to teach us a lesson, to let patience have a perfect one in us. For the sake of time, I'm jumping to the end of what I want to say. I like verse number 13 and 14 where, And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, and stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. Sometimes when we feel like we're up against the wall, I think the best advice is that Moses said, stand still. Just stand still. What does fear do? Fear can paralyze us that we don't move, but fear can also send us into a frenzy. Running here, there, everywhere else. When God says, just stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. That word still actually means this. Hold on to your seat. That word still here in Psalms 46 actually means relax. What's the last thing we want to see or hear or do when we're up against a wall like a pickle? Is relax. Because we're. But God says, relax. Stand still in me. And then this is really unique what God says to him next in verse number 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore Christ thou unto me, speak unto the children of the Lord, that they go forward. How do we do that? How do we do those two things that just seem to be on opposite sides of the spectrum? Stand still, but move forward. I've said a thousand times over that we serve a God who's on the move. So we have to move with God. God is progressive. God is moving. We have to move. But in the middle of our moving,
forward with God. We've got to stand still. There's only one direction to go, and that's forward. No man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Who wants to return like a dog returning to his own vomit? There's nothing back there for me. So I'm standing still. I'm relaxing. But I'm moving forward in the Lord. But the most important thing that showed them to stand still and to move forward was prayer. So when we find ourselves in that difficult position, pray. Stand still and relax. But keep moving. They had to keep on moving. They couldn't be paralyzed the Red Sea in front before Moses could ever lift his rod. There had to be advancement to move forward to the sea. We love the Red Sea story. We love the deliverance story from Egypt. But how often do we forget the place where God took them by before they got there? The place of liberty. The place of a fortress and tower. The place of knowing that he's the God of the Lord who's going to bring judgment. I know, I know, you're in the wilderness. The mountains are on the side. Pharaoh's army is behind you. The seas are in front. Look to the north. I bring judgment and I bring deliverance. Pray, relax, and move forward in me. If you're in that pickle, you're in that dilemma where life just seems to be coming at you in a million directions. Tonight's message was for you. It's for each of us. I'm going to stop there this evening. Does anyone have anything that they would like to say?